Thank you very much for the honor of being here with you today. And all those who uh, work hard to make me come over here, I'm uh, from my Mishnavaya King, which is a long ways from here. High carbon footprint. And I just want to acknowledge a lot of good work, uh, you know, Malia and uh, Milanani, I know a long time, asked me to come over here. And I don't know where Colette went, in the back someplace there, but uh, there she is. I slept on her floor, I believe, about 30 years ago. And that guy, Uncle Les, is the one who threw me out of the boat on the way to Koho Olave. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I am not from here, I guess you have gathered that, but it is similar. I just thought I'd show you a little bit about where I'm from, so you get, and then what I'm going to talk about here. Uh, this is a painting, I actually have this on my wall. Kind of what we're all talking about here. It's an old guy from my community. His name is Nigani Benes, one of our old chiefs, one of our old headmen, about 1886. And uh, he's drinking a cup of coffee, uh, but he's looking out, in the, out his window, and that's what he's got out his window. And that's pretty much what we're looking for. In our tradition, we have a, this story that talks about how this prophecy of this time, they call it the time of the seventh fire, when we as Anishinaabe people have a choice between two paths. One is well-worn and it is scorched. The other path is not so well-worn and it is green. Our choice upon which path to embark. I think that's pretty much where we all are. Uh, I don't know how to operate this. Okay, okay yeah, go there. This is a little bit about my community, our art, a little bit like yours, but it shows this teaching, which I think you all have. We are all related. The spiritual teaching of, you know, that we're, where we come from and all our relatives may have wings or fins or roots. And our responsibility is, is to uh, be the people who are here now and take care of all them, because we have the shot at it. So that's a little bit of that. This is, uh, I, I often think of us as islands in a continent. Uh, these are our reservations in our area. I'm the big island. Oh. <laughs> White Earth, the one over there, that's mine. 19 Ojibwe or Anishinaabe reservations in, in the United States, about 100 in Canada. That's my uh, king, my territory. That's my big, my big ocean right there, Superior. Um, that's the area that I work in largely, but I have the privilege of working nationally and mostly re-granting and trying to work on these issues of resilience in a time of climate change in, in our communities. And um, so I, I want to talk about that concept, but i show you one more picture of my uh, community. I learned this word when I was over here testifying on your tarot bill. Was that about four or five years ago? Yeah. Uh, Cosmo genealogy. I never heard that. That's Hawaiian term. I brought that home. It means these are the people we descended from. They're half spirit, half human. And that's who uh, our rice, our, all our relatives, our wild rice, that's us they're harvesting our wild rice, which is like your kalo. Similar, you know, this spiritual food. It's not just a food for your belly. It's a food for your soul and your spirits and your uh, ancestors and those who didn't come yet. And that's, uh, it's really essential as a part of when you're thinking about where you're going and, um, and what we're doing, but I'm going to talk about, um, you know, I was asked to talk about energy, but in that I'm going to talk about both food and energy because they are closely related in our communities, and we have to be very cognizant when we make our plan about where we are going and how we're going to maintain what we have, that we uh, look at both those and don't separate, I mean, just can't separate them all out. So this is my community now, 1961 and 2011. This is our wild rice harvest. On my community, um, this is up on Big Rice Lake, the, the one on the, on the left. But I show you this because we are a lot like you. I listen, I was so interested in everything everybody is saying here because it's very similar to my community. High level of subsistence harvest, very land-based, extended family, sharing your food. And uh, so it is, and, and we, are, we cannot move someplace else. That's where our rice is, that's where we are. And so all of these issues of climate change have very great significance to us. And while we retain this in such a significant level, we've also become very colonized, and now we buy our food. And so these are the issues that, as we look at you know, what it is with climate change and peak oil and the issues that we are facing, that we are facing the same issues as you are. You know, we, are, we have a bigger land base. You know, my, my, our islands are big, but it is the same thing like that. So uh, let's see, next one here. This is already, you all talk about this. Uh, my community, uh, average food travels 1,500 miles from farmer to table. Huge issue. Uh, that's a U.S. issue. Yours is about 4,000 miles, I suppose. Huh? 
I'm not sure I don't have that math down. I lost track when I was flying. But, you know, and just to say that this issue of the carbon footprint of food in terms of climate change has to be an essential part of a strategy for indigenous nations and for everybody. When we think about where it is we are going. Because it is whether it is slathered on the food, the petroleum byproducts in the fields, or whether it is transported halfway across the world. As First Nations or as you know, indigenous peoples, it is essential that we come up with this local food strategy. And you know, I heard it said, one guy, Sugar Bear Smith, from a community near ours, he said one day, he says, you know, you cannot talk about sovereignty if you cannot feed your people. You know, and a lot of us as indigenous nations, we talk about our sovereignty, but we're shopping and shopping and shopping, and we're as complicit as anybody else. And we have this you know, responsibility and this ability to restore that. So I'm gonna talk first about food and then about energy. Um, the second part of this food economy is this piece, the economics of it. Um, in our communities, and I heard that some of the representatives here from the, from the Senate also talk about it yesterday, you know, we get, we get stuck in this uh, debate, which is a false debate quite often, in my, in my estimation. It is this debate of jobs versus the environment. Or that we need jobs, this is where our economy is, is in jobs and it's jobs and we need more jobs. So we did this study on my reservation, which you could do in your communities, it is the same study and you probably have. We study our households, you know, I went out and we, we interviewed 10% of our households, we say, you know, how much is your local food? Yeah, how much you eat, maybe 20%, maybe 10%, maybe 40, 50%, my freezer's full, you know, local. But then a lot of people, when you shop, yeah, how much do you spend on food and where do you shop? So my reservation, we spend eight million bucks a year on food, of which we spend seven million dollars off reservation, like that at Walmart, Food Service of America, yeah? And we import it all, yeah, into our community. So what that represents, is, and, and what we buy local, everybody knows, same thing as you buy here, junk food, yeah? That's so why we all got diabetes in my community, right? But the point of this is, is that, is that we spend one quarter of our income on food, on my reservation. And that one quarter that is spent is drained off reservation like that. And so the, the false paradigm that is brought up in tribal planners, and I'm sure in island planners, is how you generate more income in order to pay your bills when you leak a quarter of your economy. That's, that's the, what makes no sense, is why do you want to keep bringing in more jobs when you leak, right? So one quarter of your economy is spent on food, and one quarter of your economy is spent on energy. That is our study, is on energy. I don't know what your statistics are, but I know that the United States spends one-fifth of its in income on energy, because we're addicts, and we're highly inefficient and we import everything from everywhere else, and that's what we do, right? But my reservation, because we are northern and remote, and nobody who is tribal owns a Prius, frankly, right? <laughs> We're spending a quarter of our money on energy, and that's why we have fuel poverty, which is what you have, right? And so that is the second drain on your economy. And so it is a false dichotomy, or it is a false debate to say, you need jobs or, you know, the, the environment. When the reality is, is that if you waste or lose 50% of your economy between food and energy in a drain that goes out, you will never fix that hole. Okay. This is where we, wait, you gotta go back. So this is what we are looking at in my community and your, your guy that is this is Jerry Kononui, right? That is to say, 8,000 varieties of corn, some of them gotta be worth something in climate change, right? This is not Monsanto corn, this is your grandma's corn, right? This is what we are looking at here. Our project on White Earth is doing this restoration of these varieties. I'm looking for varieties that are climate change resilient. That is to say, uh, you know, we found them seed bank like this many, so few, yeah? take those and then we take them and plant them. Now I have fields and we're working to restore these varieties in our community. We're talking away over fish guts or worm castings, I don't know, whatever, yeah, like that. But we use fish guts, yeah? But you guys have fish guts too. Um, anyway, we take these and uh, we, we, we make sure, but mine are, this one here, burial and flint, grows this tall, big ears, is drought resistant, frost resistant, and when a sear wind comes through, it's still standing, right? Monsanto's corn tip over. Mine's still standing. So that's what I'm saying is, is that we have the indigenous knowledge 
in our own culture of these varieties, but you need the biodiversity to do that. And your guy over here, you guys have the, the kalo here. Okay. This is uh, on energy, this section. I just have to own that we are as complicit in our own CO2 combustion as anybody else. Two of the biggest polluting areas in, the North, you know, in, in North America are tribal communities. Crow has the, uh, has the, uh, the power plants up there. Coal strip, one, two, three, four, four. Navajo Nation, five coal-fired power plants, right? So you have tribal communities in North America. You have one-third of all Western low-sulfur coal is on Indian reservations, right? Two-thirds of the uranium. We have been caught into this cycle that is highly dysfunctional and highly fossil fuel impactive in our own communities and our own poisoning. 50% of the revenues of the Navajo Nation are coming from CO2, right? So the challenge that we are facing, I have no coal on my reservation, thank you, creator. But at the same time, I have to look out there across and see our other communities, and this is what I'm looking at. So the transition that has to happen is, you know, my dad, my grandpa used to always say, we could blame the white man for everything, but we do a good 10% ourselves. There you go. There it is. You know, so the question is how you transition from this to what we need to do. Yeah? Okay. This you already got from everybody else. No, no point talking about renewable energy if the debate is how we meet present demand. Because the reality is, is who would want to meet present demand? It's so inefficient, right? If you're wasting 57% of the power between point of production and point of consumption, there is no way anybody is going to meet that, and there's no way anybody should, right? It's the false debate that we have to always extract ourselves from and make a real discussion. Uh, this is the Northern Plains, basically, all firmed with coal right now. It used to be water, and now it's all coal. But. So this is the potential of Indian country. We have the potential to produce maybe a third of the present electrical generation from wind and solar in Indian country. Well, just wind alone. Because it turns out, go figure, Indian reservations are the windiest place in the country. <laughs> I don't know how that worked out. It has been done. Okay? We're really, really windy. I don't even know how all some of those Indians stand up. You know, <laughs> frankly, black feet, class seven wind. They must have to like walk with like, you know, a couple of pokey things in the ground. I don't know. But my reservation up there, class four wind, right? So I look at my tribal community. Every statistic you do not want to have, we have, you know? <laughs> and you guys have the same statistics, whether it's diabetes, arrest rates, incarceration, lack of, you know, everything we got. But what we do have is we have really smart people we have a huge amount of wild rice, and we have class four wind. So if you're looking at the potential for an export economy, you might be looking at those. But these issues are the same as what Mill said. You want to produce for yourself first, you want to produce for a junkie, you know? So you got to do your own first. So let me show you what we look like. This is the answer at Navajo. I worked on this project, took CO2, uh, so, well, you know, they had put in an escrow account, SOX, and CO2 emissions from the Mojave generating station. They had to invest it in something else. They had to invest it in renewables. So we leveraged some money as Honor the Earth, the national organization. This is Denae College. This is 25 kilowatts of solar on top of them. Small scale compared to what you guys are doing, yeah? But still of scale. And that's what I have to say, which I think that these guys said quite well, is, is that size matters and it needs to be appropriate. So sometimes you need on your house. Sometimes you need for your school. Sometimes you need for your, your community. And sometimes you need big. You need all those scales if you're gonna deal with climate change. That is the reality of the situation. The question is who owns it, how it's built, if it's, if it's culturally appropriate, you know. All of those questions have to be factored in just like what Mill said. So this is Denise Sullivan. This is my community, that's my grandson. Gwen Bakanaga, I just want everybody to notice that he is outside of the yellow tape. <laughs> he was with Granny that day, and it did not occur to me what I had done till after. And so I was like, that is a really big thing hanging over my son's head. That's what my father said. <laughs> anyway, this is a, a Danish lowland wind turbine. Why did I just emphasize Danish? Oh, that's right, because we don't make any wind turbines pretty much in this country. We deindustrialized, we import everything. A number of times I've seen things come from, from uh, Spain and Germany and Denmark across the north on those, uh, that was really amazing, those photos. I don't know where those come from, but probably the same place, right? Or China. 
and Brazil, there you go. Everywhere but, uh, but the biggest energy economy, right? We just import it like that, just so far. Anyway, so this is, this is a used turbine that is refurbished and put on steroids, okay? And why I show you this too is this is a scale issue, powers a school size, and the guy who's putting it up is a veteran. Now, why did I tell you that? We have the highest rate of enlistment. You guys are probably right after us. Is that right, right? Yeah. You got all these guys that can like change a Hummer's transmission with a screwdriver. They could put up a wind turbine. That's what I'm telling you, is that green technology or appropriate technology is actually entirely different than being a nuclear engineer. Ask a guy from MIT, where a guy from MIT go? You know that, it's a different thing. You know, in this case, you have a appropriate technology. And the crane that we put this up with came from the town near us. 75 kilowatt moment. That's the scale that is appropriate for school size here or someplace else. So it is appropriate who owns it. You need to be able to fix it, just like what Mo is saying. Okay. And this is your Ojibwe lesson for the day. This is how you say, can you say this? Inashke. Inashke. Oh, very good for Hawaiians, very good. Anashke, that means ta-da. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it looks like when it goes up, okay? <laughs> and uh, I think this is the last one. This is a solar install at my house last year. And uh, a bunch of people trained out of some DOE, uh, no, actually Department of Labor program on green energy, we train them. So just in closing, you know, it is actually very, it, it is at your local community, but it has huge regional and national implications. My experience in this, you know, in organizing is, is that sometimes you can, I would say talk is cheap. You could talk about the theory, talk about this, talk about what's, you know, but do it. And then the next thing you know is someone says, how do you do that? Can we do that too? That's how they talk in my area, you know, and I, we, call it, we call it wind turbine envy. That's what's going on up there. You know, it's like, I want one bigger than that. And I was like, good, good. Make one bigger. I'm sure you can, you know. I'm sure yours will be the biggest, you know. But, you know, that's what I'm saying is, is working in our communities that have been basically run over, roughshod for, you know, all these years. Sometimes if people show that they do it, you know, and that they feel good about it and that they're the ones on it, it makes the difference on it, so. Miigwech. Mm -hmm.